you like this episode, please subscribe, share with others, rate and review so we can continue to bring you great programming. This is The Thing About Cars, a podcast for car enthusiasts and the people who love them. We are back. This is the thing about cars and around the table, we've got a short stack. Am I allowed to say that about us? Does the same sort of terminology apply? A short stack? Why am I thinking of these things? We've got Dawn. Thank you. Sorry. She's laughing at the short <laughs> stack idea. And then Misty, who's no, also No, I'm just laughing at our entry. It's like, we let's go. Let's do this. Let's just do this. And I'm landing on right short off stack the for some let's reason. Let's do this. <laughs> Dawn and Misty. Misty I am says. actually short. <laughs> yes, and sweet, and and Ben, who's short and who's not short, but is very sweet. Uh, well, I mean, I've I've been called obnoxiously tall, so uh... <laughs> <laughs> so it's just the four of us today. It's going to be a, a short episode for us. So first of all, Ben, I've got a quick joke for you. Oh boy, what has five seats in the front, seven seats in the middle, and five seats in the back? Hmm, five in the front, five at seven in the middle, and five in the back. This is something haiku related. I can tell. It's it's the haiku baru. Oh. No! I don't know. I just, I'm sorry. I'm striking out 0 for 2 so far. Oh, me, oh, my, oh. <laughs> Jambalayo. Oh, jeez. You're just, you're hurting my brain here. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. It, it needs to be challenged. And that's okay. Cause I was, I was actually considering when you introduced us and you said my name, I was going to be lotusly devoted to you. But I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Would have been very nice. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I, I, I went with the short track that we were on. Yes. Yes. So I'm pulling up some notes here. I found this chart that is the best selling vehicles in the United States and it's subdivided by state. And what do you guys think is the best-selling vehicle in the U.S.? And I'm going to tell you the data source here in a second. I believe the data source is Edmunds 2020, based on the actual number of vehicles sold. Take a stab, anybody. What's the best-selling vehicle? Oh, I'm going vehicle? for the Dodge Charger, the Dodge Challenger. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Misty, what do you I, think? I, I'm going to have to go with Dawn because I, I have no idea. Unless it would be like uh, the Versa, which is what I see a lot at rental cars. Right. Ben, what do you think? Ford F-150. Bingo. Ben nails it. Just knocks it right out of the park. So the Ford F-150, if you guys can see this, I'm going to share my screen. And, uh, we'll, we'll try to put this chart up online when we start talking about, you know, when we when this episode airs, we're going to try this up, this stuff online. But the Ford F-150 outpaces the Dodge Ram, which is the second best-selling vehicle in the United States. Where is the, I don't think that the Charger or the Challenger are even on the best-selling no, list. they're not. They're yeah. not. No. Uh, they're all road trip kind of cars. I mean, yeah. well, or, or work. I mean, I consider the Rams the F-150s and the Silverado's working vehicles. Like, you know, you have working dogs. Yep. They're, they're working vehicles. They're family. They're hauling stuff. And yeah, they're, I don't even see they, them on here. Exactly. These are fleet yeah. vehicles, right? So I, yeah. wonder, I wonder if you take the fleet element out of this list, what would, what would remain? I'm kind of curious. Maybe, well, look at that Honda CRV. It comes in, what, fifth? Yes. But but after I mean, all of those what, big vehicles. Right. Or so the F4. Go ahead, Ben. I do see a lot of non-fleet full-size pickups driving around, though. They are very popular with just regular folks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the F-150, F1... yeah, I should have yeah. thought of that. But I was, it... I was thinking cars, not trucks. And the F-150 has been in the top three for something like 30 or 40 years. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But who, what, who wants to make a comment on Florida's top cars, the Toyota Corolla? <laughs> <laughs> it's in the top 10. I know, but it's not a... It's like, okay, the Toyota just, just Corolla. E just mm -hmm. ekes out the Honda Civic. But, you know, these are econo box vehicles. These are the things yeah. that, you know, you can easily afford and in some cases easily modify, right? You don't buy an expensive car in order to drop cheap rims on it. You buy a cheap car in order to put cheap rims on it. And anyway, you know, that kind of thing. So the econo box vehicles is the everyday driver for a ton of people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is an interesting list. I don't, except for the Fords, you know, except for our SUVs and trucks, I don't see any other American cars on here. You know, you got your Ford, your Dodge, and, and they're all the, the trucks and the SUVs. Yep. There's not a single American That's Ford Escape. Car. Okay, I, I finally oh, see yeah. a Ford Escape way down there. Yeah, but Dodge is nowhere on the list. Dodge Chrysler is nowhere on the list. 
No. Um, uh, Buick's see. nowhere on the list. Buick's nowhere on the list. Yeah, it's just kind of, it makes you think though, right? It's like how much volume is being moved in the name of these major names when, anyway. Well, so. and also look at the number. So down at the end there, after the Hyundai Elantra, that cars, it looks like about 75,000 in yeah. 2020. So the only 70, that's like the list goes from 75,000 up to the Ford 150 at a little over 350,000. Right. It's like five so times as much. Yeah. Who is these other cars? They're just, I mean, they're not selling. Well, I mean, I don't know. We, we don't know what their profitability margins are or anything like that, but this is just the tip of the, the thing, right? We don't know where the other ones stack up in their actual Well, it just makes models, me think, so. think about this. There's 50 states. Yeah. 50,000 cars or less. So that means every state would be about 100 cars in that category. I mean, I'm, I'm doing the math wrong here. It's just, it just fascinates me. Like, yeah. what's, is Who this there's... just 2020 people... Well, they, I mean, this is 2020. People and there are, are so many cars. variables in there, too, because remember, not every state is alike. Right. I mean, let's right. look at the actual map itself. Florida, the only Toyota. Oh, thousand cars. On the, okay. Florida's got the Toyota Corolla listed as their bestseller. The RAV4 is big in the Pacific Northwest and in Massachusetts and in Delaware, apparently. Is that Delaware or is that? I can't do math anymore. Anyway, or my geography sucks. Maryland. Maryland. Thank you. Maryland. And Delaware, yeah, too, actually. The RAV4. Of it. Yep, in exactly. In Rhode Island. Right. So Honda's big in California. Honda CRV, that is, is in California, New York, New Jersey, and uh, Connecticut. And everywhere else in the country is like a sea of Ford F 150s. And then Dodge, for some reason, is big. The Dodge Ram is pretty big out west in uh, like three states. I, I don't know. How do you explain? Maybe there is no explanation. Maybe it's just random chance, but but how do you explain geographic variability on these things? Are just a lot of people in Toyota, a lot of people in Florida simply like the Corolla, I guess. Well, notice the trucks are big everywhere between about Indiana and the West Coast. Yeah. Now, some of those states are pretty sparsely populated. Some of them do have large farm populations. But then, of course, the, the these trucks are also big in the Southeast, where I think it's more of a just kind of a cultural thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, yeah. I was wrong about that number. It's it's a thousand pretty few fifty thousand. So yeah, uh, yeah. But you know, it just makes me think. What you, know, you go past car dealerships right now, and their lots are empty. Yep. I mean, they just don't have a lot of. Inventory. I would be curious to see a per capita examination, and I would be curious to see how twenty twenty one figures stack up against twenty twenty figures. Or twenty nineteen. Oh, yeah. I would also like yeah. to see what twenty nineteen had. Yeah. These infographs are always fascinating because they. I don't know. They, it, I, I love infographs, but I hate them. It's like yeah. it's love, hate them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe I'll contact the person who made this one or shared this one and see if they can get their hands on data for the other years and, and maybe even invite them on the show if I can. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can get to the actual creator, but it'd be cool if we can. <laughs> In Hawaii, the Toyota Tacoma is the best. I was just going to say that. Yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> why the Tacoma? And I've been to Hawaii and I'm thinking, yeah. Hmm. Very strange. And plus, too, remember, these are just the new cars. Yeah, just the new yeah. cars. That's right. Everywhere, like, and there is still a lot of farming going on. There's a lot of rural farming activity happening around Georgia, at least. I can't speak for the other states, but yeah. But anywhere there's either industry or farming going on, there's going to be a need for trucks. And Who's got yeah. the truck now with the tailgate that falls down like you're walking to a stadium, like it's got steps and it's got a speaker system and it's got a wet bar? <laughs> I believe that's GMC. Okay. Yeah. And I saw some discussion recently where somebody said something like, for the price of the built-in sound system in the tailgate, you could you could actually save a lot of money and just put a really nice boombox on the tailgate. Because <laughs> it is a very okay. expensive option, apparently. And then another person, a friend of mine, chimed in and said that he's got a uh, Honda Ridgeline, which is not only a really nice truck, but has speakers built into the bed instead of the tailgate. I presume the bed walls. He says it's really the perfect tailgating vehicle well that makes more sense having the the speakers built into the wall because then it can you get a little more amplification without having to yeah and they never get banged around from the tailgate going up and down or when you <laughs> drop your ek a flat pack on it <laughs> yeah that too so if we could customize the perfect tailgating vehicle what would it look like what would the features be Hmm. Well, I definitely, I, you know, we take our GL450 to tailgates. And one of the things I love is the way that it's so high that the lift gate comes up. You can get underneath it. 
and you can, you know, have all your stuff out and you're not, and if it's, I like that little porch kind of effect with my tailgate. You you do have to have a lot of plug-in stuff in the back, which yeah. ours does have, you can plug in a cigarette lighter and put your whatever electronic items you might need. I think you need a place for a nap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I would, yeah, go ahead, Ben. Oh, I, I think I got everybody beat. Yeah. Take a uh, a small box truck or a sprinter van, oh. and, and then install in it a complete floor that has everything you need: the grill, the comfy chair, the big TV, everything you need. Set up on this floor, which is then on a hydraulic rig that will slide out and lower to ground level. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, now, I actually saw something similar like that at Tailgate, but it was it was a motorhome that the first half was your kitchen living quarters. And the second half was this big box yeah. that had a like a porch and everything inside of it was tailgating stuff. Yep. Everything. That would be that'd be easy to do because they already make some for like, you know, little RVs that have little motorcycle garages in the back. Mm -hmm. You can adapt that really easily. Well, my, and I my, think that's what it was. I think yeah. they somebody had had modified it. My idea uh, is similar to Ben's, but a little more lowbrow. Instead of making it all hydraulically ejectable from the van, I was thinking just get a food truck with a bunch of like cafe setups, right? Little tables and chairs that you manually set up around the food truck. And then, the, too. and then the window for the food truck itself folded up and that became the television, right? So uh, uh -huh. so that the, the window itself was the television and you just lock in the place above the window where now from inside the van, you're serving all your food and your drink. That's the refreshment central part of the entire setup. But uh, Tell you what, though, for what some of these people spend on some of this stuff, because I did, I'm not a big sports fan, but one time in, in the line of duty, believe it or not, I found myself in the massive tailgating area uh, at a Dallas Cowboys game. Wow. And some of the stuff people did, they went so far and spent so much on these tailgating setups. They, they could have probably just got season tickets in the actual stadium. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, some of this stuff was extreme. There were some big TVs out there, you know, some like trailer hitch mounted grills. Satellite uh, like feeds from Dish. Yeah. They had like their own, they brought their own satellite dish. They, they bring crazy. out. They bring out a little tent the size of a phone booth with a portable toilet in it. Uh, yes. I mean, all kinds of things. Lazy I mean, boy recliners. <laughs> I wouldn't be interested in this for football purposes because my, and I probably am pissing off some of our audience by saying this, but I've never really, I've never really cared about ball that much, right? I Me I've, either. I've played sports. I've done the college thing and I just don't have any team allegiances anymore. However, if we did this for racing, I might change my mind. See, uh -huh. there you go. <laughs> well, they and do it know. for racing. Have you ever been in an in field it's pretty incredible yeah. i mean i've tailgated in an oh, infield yeah. it's pretty fun yeah. Uh, yeah but the hard part about this you can't that's the other thing you have to then have something where you now have uh you get up to the top of your rv and you put all your stuff up there so you can see the race yeah and usually you can only see the banking yeah yeah. yeah. What's also fun is that a lot of road course tracks, places like Road Atlanta, for instance, you can camp there for the whole race weekend. Mm -hmm. And I've I've heard stories about some of these, uh, you know, Road Atlanta campouts. A lot of partying and good times going on. <laughs> it, it definitely has so a very I mean, festival think... atmosphere to it. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think that's maybe why the F-150, it's a working vehicle. It's the party vehicle. Is the F-150 the one that has, is it four doors or just two doors? Either or way. Just, I think you can way. get it both ways, yeah. Both. yeah. Crew so cab it's, versus you can haul your family around in it, grocery shop. But if someone I mean, handed me a chunk of cash and said, Mickey, go buy a full-size truck, I'm not sure I would pick the Ford. I think I might pick the Chevy instead. Oh, the Silverado? Yeah. Or it's, or it's GMC equivalent. Uh, I've just heard different things. Like it's like if you're a fleet manager, you go get the Ford because there's going to be an abundance of parts. But if you're a mechanic, you pick the Chevy because there's less that's likely to go wrong with it or something like that. So we, we've actually had a guest on this show who said essentially the same thing, that if he had to buy one, he would get the Chevy instead of the Ford. The Rams yeah. are pretty nice too. The, the rental car places has given me those a couple times when they didn't have regular cars available. And I got to say, they were comfy and they had everything I needed and a big, gigantic car armrest <laughs> <laughs> see the armrest is critical yeah <laughs> yeah so misty let's change gears here for a minute and go completely off reservation here this this is i'm going to look at this recipe that you just shared can i share this on my facebook page Oh, yeah, sure. So we were talking about Taco Bell and the long lost Taco Bell Mexican pizza, which somehow in their wisdom, Taco Bell has decided to ruin everything you love about their menu, right? Right. <laughs> totally. 
Right. And so the Taco Bell pizza is a longtime favorite. I love the stuff. So thank you very much for, for sharing this thing with me. I can't wait to make my own. But this reminds me of something you saw also said online, which is you're going to treat your kids' friends to a Thanksgiving dinner in the Netherlands? Yeah. Um, Are we allowed to talk about that? Yeah, sure. I, in, any chance to embarrass the offspring is uh, <laughs> always <laughs> welcome. It's kind of what I do. No, my, my son has a pretty close group of friends from his high school days, and uh, they're, they're all really good kids. And one of his friends is coming over next weekend, and she's uh, like super excited because I was like, okay. She's like, I don't care what you cook. I just want American. So I was like, <laughs> okay. Uh, I could do the whole hamburgers, wings, things up. But I was like, you know what? I really want to do like honest to God Tex-Mex. So, you know, Ah. and then the other day I ran up to my son's room to tell him something. And he was talking with two of his other friends. And for some reason he hands his headset to me. I'm like, okay. So I'm talking with his friends and we kind of just roll into this idea. And I was like, why don't y'all just all come over and, you know, we'll do like an American Thanksgiving dinner. So like, you know, like November 27th or something. So that's on like, a, like that's like the Saturday after. And so it, it kind of like steamrolled into there. And I was kind of wondering, you know, I was like, at what point in time do I inform these rather well-educated young European people, because they're all over 18, that mac and cheese is a veg. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's so, plant based. It's, it's plant based. Come on. Yes, well, I mean, right. I mean, if, if you go to any southern cafe, soul food or whatever, and you get the meat and two veg, macaroni and cheese is right there in the veg section of that menu. So it's a veg. <laughs> and it's it, it's been really interesting trying to plan this menu out, dealing with different religious beliefs, allergies, texture issues, and I and I'm gonna say it because I was like, you know, I was like, we cannot have Thanksgiving dinner without banana pudding. That's right. And then the whole thing about the whole point of this American holiday is just to eat a whole bunch of different golden brown foods and then pass yeah. out. And, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. then be in a, in a turkey stoop. Oh my. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'll, 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 I'll. So Mi- Misty, before you go on, there's something you said earlier on that I kind of wanted to explore a bit, but one of the friends said, oh, I just want to have American. And I had two simultaneous thoughts. One, it's funny that Tex-Mex counts as American since it's half Mex. And <laughs> hey, Central America. All right. Yeah. All right. Cool. That's right. Yeah. And then the other part is that isn't American food. It, it kind of shocks me. And this, you know, again, this is my own American central, just not getting out enough stupidity here. But is American food really that different from European food? And don't they have restaurants that serve American food over there already anyway? Yes and no. Okay. You know, there's a lot of American cuisine, of course, that's based on European cuisine because at the gist of it, a lot of us are European and we have European ancestry. Yeah. But then there's the influence in the United States of, you know, you have the big, huge African influence. You know, as you get further to the West Coast, you have the, the more of the Asian influence. And then you have the indigenous influence as well mm-hmm. across, you know. So, but it, it's simple things, you know. It's like if I go to the movie theater, you know, like a couple of years ago, they started carrying nachos. And I was like, yes. And then you realize that the nacho chips have this, what they call cheese powder on it. So they're kind of more like, they're not just plain corn chips, right? but it's also kind of sweet. It's it's like the difference between Dutch Chinese food and American Chinese food. Dutch Chinese food tends to be really sweet and I don't like it because I don't like that whole sweet thing. And uh, like for this Thanksgiving dinner, Thanksgiving dinner, I'm not doing a turkey. I'm going to do a chicken, but I'm going to do a beer butt chicken. And my son was like, can you please not traumatize my friends? (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, it's going to be even better when you see how I have to arrange the legs so it doesn't fall off, fall over. Because, you know, and you turn it to the side and it looks like the chicken's running. <laughs> and, and I'm kind of going, mashed potatoes or sweet potato casserole? Because there, there is no sweet potato casserole here. Right. You and, know? you know, I think, Misty, Miss, you're right. When I lived in Europe, um, one of the things that we didn't have was corn. I mean, mm-hmm. anything corn is American. And I yeah. and I mean, Central American to Canada, corn yep. is you big anything. I remember when we moved, my parents got restationed down south again and having cornbread for the first time. I was like, oh, I miss cornbread. I, I have believe. such a hard time finding the right grind because they, they have the polenta, which is right. Italian, Italian, but it's a much finer grind. So finding the right grind. 
up until about four or five years ago, I couldn't get the sweet corn. The corn that I could get was really, it was really different. It was really starchy. It was really coarse. And, and you know, if you're like me and have texture issues, you're like, hang it. <laughs> please <Yeah>. no. <laughs> because a lot of it was, and, and even my husband says that, he, my husband doesn't like corn and he's like, oh God, that's pig food. Yeah. I'm like, well, just strap a curly tail on me and, you know, call me babe. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been in the past four years that I can find it in the regular mainstream grocery store. But I get like two ears in a pack and it literally says on the label, American sugar corn. Or wow. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, what, what we would call sweet corn, just because it's not a thing, especially uh, here in, in Northern Europe, very much like mustard greens. I can't right. get mustard greens. I can't get turnip greens because that's pig food. And I mean, I got really excited because I found a place uh, where I can actually get good mustard green, honest to God, mustard green seeds. And I'm looking at starting a pot garden, not that kind of pot. <laughs> yeah. Container garden. A container garden. Sorry, I was thinking in Dutch, in container garden in my backyard, looking for green tomatoes so I can have the ubiquitous fried green tomatoes. And they're like, what are that? And the only thing I can get with any regularity is okra, believe it or not. And I have to go to the it's so Moroccan weird to butcher. Me. Yeah, it's so weird to me that, a, that a, a continent that is so into offal, and I mean organ meats, right? Offal is thinking that turnip greens and sweet corn is pig food. Yeah, and, I mean, but also, you know, I think America is also very regional. I yeah. mean, you, you know, Misty's telling us a bunch of wonderful Southern food, but Northeast is different. And it has very much European influences with American twists on them. Yep. The, the Midwest, I mean, corn fed kids out there. It's like, yep. yeah, I think it's, I think also American food is very regional. Yeah, you're right. It is. It is. But you also have to realize though, that Georgia, especially Georgia, especially does not have that Nordic and Germanic influence that the Northeast has the Midwest. West has, you know, mm -hmm. Georgia was not settled. Georgia was mainly settled by Irish. And we've had that yeah. discussion that my ancestors on my mom's side are buried under one of the runways at Savannah Airport. And there's a plaque on the run. There's, there's two plaques on the runway to, because the family would not agree to have them moved when they expanded the runway. Wow. So it's Irish and it's English. And that's why the Georgian mm. mountain dialect known as Appalachian is a lot closer to Queen's English, earlier English. Like, like in the Midwest, you have like Opa when you mm. drop something, Opa. But that's very German, you know, that's very mm. Dutch, Nordic, yep. you know, and Germanic. We just don't have that influence. You know, we don't have that as much of a potato based as, as, as they do in other places. So, no. and then I just, no. but that's just, you know, so, but I'm, I'm looking at surprising the kids thinking, I kind of want to do the green bean casserole, but I've got someone with an allergy to um, mold. So mushrooms are out. Sad. But that's very sad. Yeah. I kind of felt sorry for her. Cause I was like, that means you can't eat the blue cheese. I was like, oh man. Yeah. And on the other hand, I was like, yeah, more for me. <laughs> well, good on you um, for, for bringing a Thanksgiving meal to those folks. I think I'm hoping they enjoy every minute of it. I hope they do too. Although I had to laugh at one of them because trying to be the responsible hostess, I sent out a Google sheet saying, okay, are you coming over? You know, are you going to be here? Are you staying the night? Do you have any allergies? Do you have the things you cannot eat. And uh, one of the, one of the young men wrote back with, I likely won't be eating very much. And I'm like, um, I looked at my son. I said, you need to explain to him. <laughs> he needs to adjust his attitude when coming to eat at a Southern lady's house. <laughs> <laughs> there is none of this. I, I likely won't be eating very much. I'm like, okay, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Well, cool. How do we steer this back to the world of cars before we wrap our episode? You know, we, we never. I was going to say you need a nice big truck to get all your stuff. For That's right. Thank you for yeah. listening to the thing about food. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'm, I'm, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to cook the chicken on the manifold of my MX-5. I'm lying. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it has been done. Mythbusters yeah. did it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it has been done. You know, there, there's a lot of people on, I've, I've known that go car camping and they cook using their car. And I'm like, hey, that's... Engine heat. That's right. Yeah. Well, I remember my mom telling me, because I mean, my mom got like really big into the horsey thing and she would go like horse shows and there were people that'd be parked with their jaguars and everything and they'd pop the trunk and they'd have like a microwave oven that was wired into the jaguar so they could have their snacks and their tea and whatever while they were doing their horsey thing that's interesting yeah, yeah. i'm like so weird. but you know it, for me the one thing about trucks that is i've never owned a truck i don't remember if there's ever been a truck 
I think my dad had a truck when he was managing a recycling center once. But other than that, I've never had a truck. Because to me, why would you get a truck when you can get an SUV right. and keep everything dry and leave it in there? And I, I mean, during tailgate season, because we have season tickets to Georgia State football, and we leave all our tailgate stuff in the back of the SUV, and we don't take it out until the season's over. So I'm just kind of wondering, tell me why truck is better than, than an SUV. You just, I mean, you can line it and make sure so that things don't get all dirty and you put seats down well, and extend the bed i mean I, it's I easier know. to get tons of bags of concrete and compost and stuff like that out of the bed of a truck than it is into an suv you just go up and over the side instead of through the back right there's i think more freedom of motility of that the truck. said i think many truck purchasers really overestimate their needs and then there's also these just the style factor some just like it i mean my dad once i saw him bring home four Four, four by eight sheets of ply plywood stacked on a Sunbeam Alpine. <laughs> Oh, yes. Strapped on. It was kind of diagonally across the car so that he, his head could still stick up out the driver's seat. And this is, for those not familiar, the Sunbeam Alpine was a little convertible made in England back in the 60s that he had several of in various condition states of running. But, but yeah, a, a lot of people who buy trucks overestimate what they need. And you really can do a lot with a decent SUV. In fact, I've, I've got a little Mazda 3 hatchback that I put amazing loads into. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I can't believe the stuff we shove in the GL. I really, I mean, when we go anywhere, that thing, you can't see out the back rearview mirror. It's packed up to the brim. Um, we've moved some incredible things in that. Uh, yeah. And how many people need to move a sofa? I mean, that's the only thing oh, yeah. that I think an F-150. I don't, I don't even think you need a truck to move a sofa. I mean, here in the Netherlands, we do it on a bicycle. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm not even kidding. I mean, I, it, 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 you know, it's the Bakfitsa, the, the ones that have like the container thing in the front. I've seen people moving a two-person sofa on one once, of those. I once got wow. an antique desk into the back of a Mark IV GTI. Wow. Oh, so taking that. A, yeah, we didn't take any of it apart either. See, and I can put, I can put my third row seat down and fit, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people in my GAL. I mean, yeah. you can't fit eight people and even a four. I have yeah. to be four. honest. I think a lot of it has to do with ego because SUVs <laughs> have moved into the realm of this is the wife's car. Yeah. And I mean, I'm sorry, if you're a, a, a lawyer or someone who wears a suit to work every day, I don't, I mean, I don't see you needing a pickup. I don't, especially a pickup with heated seats and surround sound and navigation. And <laughs> to me, a pickup mm -hmm. is a working vehicle. Right. You know, yeah, no, and, yeah, exactly. And if you're pulling a fifth wheel, now, you know, you got to have a truck. You're not going to yeah. be, and there's no SUV oh, yeah. that can pull a fifth wheeler unless you cut off the back. So, I mean, I, I see the utility. I just, for most people, I just think I'm surprised that I, so that's the thing. I'm surprised that the F-150 is so high. Yeah, um, I mean, it's the same so many. Here. That's just shocking. I mean, I look at that map and think, wow, that's the entire, that's all of the middle of the country, except for the coast and what was it, um, Wisconsin or Minnesota. Otherwise, yeah. every other state from Idaho to Virginia was the F-150. And, and you can't tell me that all of those people are hauling horse feed, dog feed, manure, bales of hay, whatever. You can't tell me. They're hauling flat pack from Ikea. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, that's it. And you can do that just fine in, in, in an SUV. We did it. I've done it numerous times with the CX-5 until somebody stole my CX-5. Well, mm. I can tell you what, as our, for our wonderful listeners across the country who are listening to us, you're going to be hating us. Because <laughs> <laughs> statistically, you're, some of you are driving an F-150 or a I, Silverado. I want a truck. I, I don't know why I want a truck. I mean, there have been times in the past when I have needed it, but you're right. It's like 1% of my driving time I could ever have actually used a truck for something like a sofa or, you know, a load of something right. for the yard or something. But the rest yeah. of the time, it's like I'm content to be in my little sedan. But I, you know, I just, I don't know why, but it's that I want it when I need it kind of thing. I don't want to have to go to Home Depot to rent their stupid truck to get some stuff home, right? And and I uh, will say that I do hope as the auto industry, car industry evolves, that, that it's still an option. My fear is that, you know, when you look at moving to EVs, this is, it's going to be harder and harder to justify some some of these larger vehicles. Don't you, don't you think, Ben? 
Uh, well, not really. Ford's already got an electric F-150 out and Rivian is about to make a big splash in the market. They, they're getting pretty close to, I mean, they've been, they've been advertising for open jobs in the Atlanta area. So they're getting ready to uh, hit the streets. But what about, I mean, these folks are in rural areas. They don't go in, I guess they'll just charge up at home because there's no charging stations out there. The the, the rural folks will will think that the electric truck is kind of a weenie wussy thing at first, but then once they've used it, I think they'll be all right. Okay. So this is where we start to fade out. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, you know, I was sitting here and this idea just popped into my head of a self-powered, yeah, what's the English word for it? In Dutch, we call it an anhangwache, like a trailer. So it's, it has its own battery and it kind of helps powers itself. So you, you don't need as big of a car to pull it. So you're, all you need is a tow hitch. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I mean, of course, that idea probably needs more fleshing out, but it was just kind of like one of those, that would work, you know, if it could kind of like help power itself so that you weren't relying totally on the car. And that would help solve some of the problems while still remaining environmentally friendly. <laughs> I am serious when I said that's when we were going to start to fade out. So I think that's the end of the episode. So. <laughs> we can fade Bye. out. Bye. Bye. <laughs> See ya. Have a great week. <laughs> Have fun. So uh, <clears throat> we'll end the episode there. This still want to do a, a proper outro, though. You can, I mean, you can cut out a lot of the our talk about food. Oh yeah, we yeah. can we can cut that down. I'm not too worried about that. That was fun. Yeah. What does the outro need, Ben? You want to do it? Uh, let me let me think for a sec. Yeah. Make something witty and catchy out of some of that. We didn't do a <laughs> trivia question. We did not. No, we didn't. Well, let, let, let me. Although the F-150 here. could have been a trivia question, and Ben got it right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and Ben, you can use my lotusly devoted to y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Well, folks, if you have any more concerns about what kind of food you're going to haul around in your electric F-150, be sure to let us know. Drop us a line at The Thing About Cars, and we will see you next week. Bye now. See ya. Later. Thank you for listening. This has been The Thing About Cars. We'll see you on the road.